what's going on? A push piece. We have period eight for you today. This one we're going to do in about 10 minutes. This is the second last time period, and it counts for 15% of the new curriculum. Before we begin, it's shout out time. Shout out to Ms. Song's class in South Korea. I cannot believe my videos are being watched in South Korea. Mr. Campbell's A push and government classes. Adam S. and the rest of Mr. King's A push class. Mr. McGinney from the Elizabeth Learning Center. Mr. Angel's class at Berkeley High School. Mrs. Pillar Saad in Florida, Peshaw High School in Fort Worth, Texas, and Ms. Greenswag and Mr. Malone at Liberty High School. You all will do great. Thank you so much for watching my videos. All right, let's start talking about the post-World War II economy. We have a prosperous economy that is caused by the following. We have federal spending, a baby boom generation, which happens right after World War II. This is going to be the largest generation in quite some time and technological developments. So what are the impacts of this? Well, we have an improved higher education, things like the GI Bill, which provides education for returning soldiers, and the growth of the Sun Belt, which is this area in red. It is mentioned twice in the new curriculum, so you better know that it's the areas down south where it's warm and defense industries are popping up. We do see some challenges to conformity in the 1950s by artists such as the Beat Generation, People like Jack Kerouac, and it's similar to the lost generation of the 1920s, and intellectuals as well. The Affluent Society is a book that reveals how, how the economy is not as prosperous for all. All right, let's jump on over to U.S. foreign policy post-World War II. It could be summarized in one word, and that word is containment. It was created by George Kennan, and the idea is that the U.S. would seek to keep communism from spreading. And there is George Kennan, lived to be 101 years old. Now, containment takes on many different forms. You see it in collective security, like NATO, which is an alliance that the U.S. joined. George Washington would not like that. And also economic frameworks, things like the Truman Dodger and the Marshall Plan, which provided money for Europe to rebuild after World War II. We also see it in conflicts, things like Korea and Vietnam. In both instances, the North was communist and the U.S. supported the South. So that's a way to keep communism from spreading. The U.S. and the Soviet Union fluctuated between detente and indirect confrontation during this time. SALT, or the Strategic Arms Limitation Treaty, is an example of detente or easing of tensions. By the way, detente is mentioned twice in the new curriculum. And the Cuban Missile Crisis, the, the closest the two sides ever came to war. So what was the Cold War impact on other countries and regions of the world? Well, the U.S. and the Soviet Union saw allies among new decolonized countries, especially countries like India, which gained independence shortly after World War II. And in Latin America, the U.S. supported non-communist governments, even if they weren't the most democratic. That will be a theme for the United States. They will support governments that are not the most democratic, but simply because they are not communist. And the U.S. involvement in the Middle East, and the U.S. became involved in the Middle East several times. This helped lead to oil crises, especially the 1973 oil embargo after the U.S. backed Israel in the 1973 Yom Kippur War. All right, both parties supported containing communism abroad. However, there were debates that emerged over how to root out communists domestically in the United States. We have things like Truman's loyalty program, which made federal workers take a loyalty oath. We have McCarthyism, Joseph McCarthy in the Senate, who attacked everybody and their mother being a communist. The Red Scare, which is a part, which McCarthyism is a part of. HUVAC, the House Committee in the 1940s that investigated the Hollywood Ten, the Rosenbergs who were put to death, etc. All these were ways to try to root out communists at home. The Korean War saw some domestic opposition, not much, but the Vietnam War saw large and often and sometimes violent protests, especially after 1968 with the Tet Offensive and 1970 with the bombing of Cambodia. That will lead to the Kent State Massacre. In Eisenhower's farewell address in 1961, he warned about the military-industrial complex, which, by the way, is specifically mentioned. And he basically said the country needs to be careful about spending too much money on the military during peacetime. And debates emerged about the executive, the power of the executive branch, especially during the Vietnam War with the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution, which essentially gives the President of the United States a blank check. All right, let's jump over to civil rights, huge part of the curriculum. I do have videos on civil rights in the 1950s and 1960s. Please check that out in the description. There are many different strategies, whether they're legal, direct action, or nonviolent protests. And all three branches of the government promoted civil rights. We see this in the executive branch with Executive Order 9981, which was issued by Truman, which desegregated the military. The judicial branch we see in Brown versus the Board of Education, which was argued by this lawyer and future justice Thurgood Marshall. 
In the legislative branch, we see the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which eliminates segregation everywhere. There was white resistance to desegregation in the South. You see it in things like the Southern Manifesto, the protest of 100 congressmen who said that the Supreme Court overstepped its power. Massive resistance is the idea of shutting down schools rather than desegregating. In the Little Rock Nine, when Eisenhower had used the military to enforce desegregation. Post-1965, there were debates that emerged among activists on whether or not uh, how to best achieve further goals. Um, you see the emergence of groups like the Black Panthers that promoted black power. All right, rights for other groups and other social issues. The thing to keep in mind, the civil rights issue is going to inspire other groups to demand civil rights as well. Women's rights, we'll see with Betty Friedan's The Feminine Mystique. This challenged the 1950s cult of domesticity. And she argued that many housewives were, were living unfulfilled lives in the 1950s. Gays and lesbians see rights after the Stonewall Riots in 1969, which is the birth of the gay rights movement. Latinos with Cesar Chavez, he led a grape picker strike and a hunger strike. He helped bring awareness to the plight of Mexican-American Mexican farm workers. American Indians, you see the Indians of all tribes and the American Indian movement. They use protests to bring attention to their, to their plight. And they even took over Alcatraz Island. And there's an awareness of poverty as well. Michael Harrington's The Other America was this very influential book that helped influence LBJ's Great Society. Speaking of the Great Society, um, let's talk about liberalism first. And this is using the government to promote social well-being. And it reached its zenith under the Great Society. Zenith is underlined because this is a word mentioned in the new curriculum and it means its height. So the highest point of liberalism was a great society. And they sought to end discrimination. You see that in the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965. They want to eliminate poverty. You saw this in, with food stamps and Medicaid and fix other social issues such as education. Now, the Supreme Court in the 1960s, the Warren Court is not mentioned specifically, but the Supreme Court in the 1960s is. They promoted individual freedoms. See this in Griswold versus Connecticut, which ruled that birth control which ruled a Connecticut law banning birth control was illegal and established the doctrine of the right to privacy, which will be later used to make abortion legal in the court case Roe versus Wade. And this is going to help inspire a conservative movement, which we'll talk about in the next time period. Now, people on the left felt that liberals did not go far enough to change society racially and economically. And you see that with the Black Panthers founded by this dude, Huey Newton, and also the Students for a Democratic Society or SDS. So there were people on the left who said, hey, LBJ, you did not go far enough. And there are conservatives on the right who are saying, hey, LBJ, you went too far. All right, demographics and counterculture, 1950s image of a nuclear family, two children, suburbs, stay at home mom. It's seen here in this in this picture from the famous TV show Leave it to Beaver. What is the reality? Well, more women were working as time went on, especially in the 1970s. The counterculture are hippies. They challenged their parents' generation ideals. Big thing that they used were drugs and they instituted a sexual revolution. Now, debates emerged between conservatives and liberals. We see Bach versus University of California, in which the Supreme Court ruled that race could be a factor in and an applicant for college, but quotas for minority candidates was was not allowed. All right, we'll finish up with immigration and environmentalism. Immigration Act of 1965, holy cow, know this. This reversed the quota system for the 1920s, the 1921 and 1924. It favored immigration from Asia and Latin America, and these were traditionally underrepresented groups. Rachel Carson wrote a book called Silent Spring. There's good old Rachel. Very, very influential. And she brought awareness to environmental problems, specifically pesticides and its impact on the environment and water. And this helped lead to the creation of the Environmental Protection Agency, the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, you name it. The environmental movement can really be traced back to Rachel Carson and Silent Spring. All right, let's do a quick recap. The Sun Belt, know it. What is containment? What was the goal of it? Truman Doctrine and Marshall Plan gave money to Europe. NATO was an alliance that the U.S. joined, and the Korea and Vietnam War were examples of containment. Detente, know what that bad boy is. The military-industrial complex, what did Eisenhower warn of? Three branches of civil rights, how did each one contribute to the civil rights movement? Great Society, what was LBJ's goals with that? The Feminine Mystique, what, what did Betty Friedan argue in that? In Silent Spring, Rachel Carson brought attention to the environmental movement. The counterculture of hippies, what were they protesting? And finally, the Immigration Act of 1965 reversed the quotas from the 1920s. 
All right, guys, thank you very much for watching. I do appreciate it. I look forward to seeing you right back here for period nine in 10 minutes. This will be the last one. Thank you for watching. Please check out my playlist of 10 minute videos and my periods one through five and six through nine review videos, which will help you with everything you need to know for this AP exam. And good luck. Don't ever forget that you are brilliant and you are more than a test score always. Thank you very much for watching. I look forward to seeing you right back here for period nine and have a good day.